This is the eighth in a series of lectures on differential geometry. In the last lecture, we thought about brackets of vector fields, and we said that this led us to thinking about the commutation of their flows, which behaved something like a group of diffeomorphisms of a manifold. The problem being that there, the flows, of course, weren't necessarily globally defined. But if they were, we got into something like a group of transformations of a manifold. In this lecture, we want to think about groups of transformations of manifolds, which are traditionally known as Lie groups. The precise definition is simply that a Lie group is a group, but is also a manifold um, at the same time, and the, let's say, a group G, but also it's a manifold, and the group multiplication operation, which you can think of as mapping uh, any two elements of the group to their product, is a smooth map of manifolds. So that's the definition of a Lie group. A Lie group. I'll always denote the identity element as 1. Historically, Lie thought about uh, Lie groups uh, as symmetry groups of differential equations. And it is true that typically, if you have a differential equation as arising in in science or engineering, that usually its symmetries do form a Lie group. Nevertheless, um, we find that to construct simple examples of Lie groups and to understand a lot about um, how Lie groups work, we usually start not from differential equations but from linear algebra. In fact, not only is it true that there are lots of simple examples uh, of Lie groups coming from linear algebra, but it's also true that, that almost all the important ones come uh, straight out of linear algebra and are al almost uh, familiar already from your experience of linear algebra. So I'll always or use the expression little k to mean either the real numbers or the complex numbers or the quaternions. And if you're not familiar with the quaternions, that's not really a problem. You can look them up if you like. We won't really need them. I'll refer to various results about various quaternionic uh, examples of, of, of Lie groups and uh, of quaternionic linear algebra facts, but you don't need to know them. Uh, it isn't essential to what we're doing. It's good enough to concentrate just on the real and complex examples. So a simple example of a Lie group then would be uh, the general linear group GL, sorry, GLNK, where K means either the real complex or quaternionic numbers, is the set of all n by n invertible matrices. Uh, with entries in K. Um, so real complex or quaternionic matrices which are invertible. And this is just an open set inside uh, the set of n by n matrices. And so that's why it's a manifold, because it's an open set. And multiplication is clearly uh, a, a nice smooth operation in the in smooth in the entries of, of a matrix. And so we can see immediately that that's already an, an example of a Lie group. In the same way, if we had, a, say, a finite dimensional vector space over the field K, or over the quaternions, which aren't quite a field, but close enough, um, then, uh, then we, could also, um, we could also let GLV be the um, invertible linear, the set of invertible linear transformations, so k linear transformations, where k is our, is our field um, uh, of uh, v to v. And that also is a Lie group because, after all, it's just isomorphic to that by picking a basis. Now, if, uh, if we have a, a, a subgroup, which is also a submanifold, we'll call it a Lie subgroup, a Lie subgroup. Uh, each uh, of uh, of some Lie group G means a subgroup, uh, which is also as a set of points inside G is a submanifold. Um, so an example would be um, if you looked inside the um, n by n invertible matrices, you could look inside there at um, H is the set of all, um, uh, let's say, uh, upper triangular invertible matrices. 
Um, so that's an example of something that's a subgroup. It's also a submanifold because you're simply setting certain of the of the variables to be zero. Certain of the of the entries of the matrix have to be zero. So given by a symbol, a linear equation. The quaternions themselves form a Lie group as do the complex numbers. So a quaternion. Um, let's write H for the quaternions. A quaternion is supposed to be a a, 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 a collection of real numbers q1, q2, which writes uh, q, q0, q1, q2, q3. We'll write them as q0, q1i, q2j, q3k. With the multiplication operation being usual for complex numbers for this part, but also um, if we have uh, we have j squared is minus one, k squared is minus one as well. So they also behave like roots of minus one, just like i does. And then i times j is k, k times i is j, and so on. But then if you go backwards, j times i is minus k, k times j is minus i, and so on. Okay, so that's how we can multiply them. And then, of course, the non-zero ones, this is uh, h cross, is the set of, uh, comp uh, of quaternions that are not the zero quaternion. That's uh, obviously a Lie group under multiplication. Well, you can check it's a Lie group under multiplication. Um, and uh, and of course also the the unit length quaternions the set of unit length uh, quaternions uh, is also a Lie group under multiplication. Now of course this thing is of course a, a four dimensional um, space. We can say that after all the quaternions are obviously identified with four dimensional Euclidean space, and so the unit length quaternions are the the three dimensional sphere contained in four dimensional space. Um, so that puts, ma makes that sphere into into a Lie group, and you can check that it's a Lie group. Another example um, it would be the affine transformations. It's nice to have examples that really are sort of you know, geometric transformations. An affine uh, transformation of k n, where k again could be the real complex or quaternion numbers, means a transformation of the form um, x goes to a x plus b, where this part is a linear transformation. And this part is just a constant uh, a translation by a constant vector. And the set of all such trans uh, uh, of all such affine transformations is a Lie group. You can take as the variables the entries of the of the matrix of the linear transformation and the entries of the vector of the translation. It's a convenient result which we uh, which we will eventually prove um, that um, every closed subgroup um, a theorem which we will prove every um, subgroup uh, H containing G of a Lie group which is closed as a subset uh, so it's a subgroup of a Lie group G um, which is closed as a subset as a set of points and uh, oh is um, is an embedded uh, submanifold So it's actually an embedded, an embedded uh, Lie subgroup. We said a Lie subgroup had to be a submanifold um, and a subgroup. So it's an embedded Lie subgroup. Um, so that makes it. Uh, it well, as I say, we'll prove this eventually. We won't prove it right now, but it does make it easy to write down lots of examples. So the following examples, you can uh, use this theorem to check that they are examples. But you could also more directly just check um, by using the implicit function theorem. Well, we've already said that the general linear group is an example. That's the n by n invertible matrices. Uh, the special linear group over the real numbers or over the complex numbers is the ones with uh, determinant equal to 1, the matrices that have determinant 1. So these are all the invertible matrices. These are the invertible matrices with determinant 1. Um, and then S L N H, that's uh, where they have uh, determinant one as real linear transformations, because every linear transformation, every quaternionic linear transformation, is automatically uh, also real linear transformation when we think of the quaternions as four real numbers. If it's quaternionic linear, it has to be real linear, and we'll make ask that it's determinant as a real linear transformation is one. That's a, a nice example. We won't really make a lot of use of this, but it's nice to see that there are simple examples. One we've already taken a look at, uh, we've already been examining carefully, is the orthogonal group. Uh, the orthogonal group. Uh, group. Uh, 
So the orthogonal group is uh, one we've checked already as, as, a, as an example. The special orthogonal group, that's the, um, the determinant one matrices that happen to be orthogonal. Um, that's a nice example. Um, similarly, there's an SONC, which is, uh, strangely enough, that's the um, called the special uh, compl complex special orthogonal group, the special orthogonal. S is often for special, special linear. So maybe I should write that here. Spe these are called special linear groups. Uh, this is the special orthogonal group or the group of rotations. And the complex special orthogonal group is the a stabilizer of, um, of the linear transformations that stabilize a quadratic form, uh, which is a, no, a non-degenerate quadratic form. Complex linear, complex uh, 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 bilinear quadratic form. Um, and uh, so on and so forth. Let's see, the unitary group. This is the um, orthogonal uh, matrices, uh, 2n by uh, 2n matrices, but that as complex, that are also complex uh, coefficient n by n matrices. Every such matrix then acts, when you treat the real, the complex numbers again as uh, pairs of real numbers, then every n by n matrix becomes a 2n by 2n real matrix acting as real linear transformations. And so, um, so we can ask that they be orthogonal real transformations. Um, so that gives us some nice examples. Then the special, again, special usually means determinant 1, S, U, and um, is uh, the unitary uh, matrices with determinant 1, special unitary. And uh, so it gives us some nice examples to play with um, of lots and lots of uh, of uh, groups, of Lie groups. And it turns out they're basically things we've already seen from linear algebra. But there are other examples that are maybe not so linear algebraic. Um, one of the obvious examples is, is that we've said already unit quaternions, but of course you could do a simpler example, which is the unit complex numbers. The circle uh, in, contained in the complex plane is the, um, the set of, uh, S1 is the set of uh, complex numbers such that the norm of the complex number is one. Um, so unit complex numbers in the complex plane. And uh, and that circle, of course, is a Lie group because we know it's a nice smooth manifold, and also it's got a, a smooth multiplication operation, smooth in the entries of the of the complex number. Um, of course, another uh, trivial example is that if G and H are Lie groups, then G cross H is a Lie group because it's a smooth manifold. Um, each of these is smooth manifolds. The product is then a smooth manifold. And then it's trivial to see that the multiplication is smooth because it's smooth in each of the entries. And so that gives us a exa new example, new collection of examples. And we can put that together with the ones we've already got. We've got the circle and we've got the ability to take products. So the n-dimensional torus is um, S1 cross dot 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 cross S1. Careful, of course, that of course uh, S, uh, T n is not S n. S one cross 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 S one in for for a differential geometry is not the same thing as as uh, as S n. Um, we have to, as I said before, be careful about the fact that when we write M n, we often just mean M as an n-dimensional manifold. We don't mean n fold product of M. Although sometimes we do, but usually we don't. So that uh, is not the same thing as M cross that dot cross M n times, for which I probably would need to use this notation to avoid confusion with the two. Um, are they equal or not? Depends on how I feel. Sometimes I'll use this notation to mean this, but in this case I'm not doing it. I'm using the notation Tn, uh, calling it the n-dimensional torus, deliberately not calling it Sn because that would be uh, confusing with the sphere. Okay, so that's the torus, and it's a Lie group for the obvious reason. Now, um, um, Lie group morphism or homomorphism of Lie groups. It means, of course, a map of Lie groups, which has to be smooth, but also has to be a group. Homomorphism, or morphism uh, for short. Okay, so it's a group morphism that happens to be a smooth map. And we can give lots of examples of those. A um, simple example of a Lie group morphism um, is uh, if we take uh, the 
real numbers uh, n times over. So again, this this is our n our Euclidean space, so a vector in Euclidean space, and we map it to e to the two pi i x one. Oh, I'm not using Einstein notation at the moment, maybe because I put that as a subscript. Um, e to the two pi i x n, and that'll be in the n-dimensional torus because it's a bunch of unit complex numbers. And you can see that this is a Lie group morphism because if you add vectors here, you multiply over here the results um, coming out the other end. In some sense, the exponential function was always a Lie group morphism. You could always take x in the real numbers and multiply it, uh, or as I put it, to e to the x in the, in the non-zero real numbers. And that's a Lie group morphism that takes uh, the d addition operation here. That's a Lie group under addition. And this is a Lie group uh, under multiplication. Um, so often we'll write our Lie groups uh, with multiplicative uh, notation. We'll almost always use multiplicative notation, but sometimes we can use additive notation for groups as well. So we, we want to see um, how bad Lie groups can get, uh, how bad the, the uh, morphisms can get. And this is about the worst example I can think of. Um, it's not very bad. Take the plane and um, in the plane, take a line, and let's suppose the line uh, has uh, some irrational slope, so y equals root 2x. This is x and this is y. Now what I'm going to do, of course, is to, to quotient this thing out and produce the torus, um, because we like the torus. So we're going to um, identify opposite sides of squares. What happens? So we've got a morphism of the real number line. Um, to the plane, which is given by taking any point x, goes to x and then root 2x. y is root 2x. That maps us to the line. That, that morphism has this line as its image. But then we're going to map the plane to the 2 torus by our favorite map, which is, as, as we said before, just taking these exponentials. Um, so we've got this 2 torus which is, uh, of course, you could write as r. Let's write it as r2 mod z2. Um, and so the map that takes the plane to this guy is um, the plane goes to, let's say, so we have an x, y in the plane, and it's going to go to some point on the torus, which is uh, e to the 2 pi i x, e to the 2 pi i y. And what does this this line do when you wrap it onto the torus? It's uh, it's not hard to convince yourself that it, it winds uh, in a manner that uh, that's dense. Ah, very bad drawing, but anyway, um, it goes around and comes back around and so on and so forth. It never repeats itself. Why does it do that? Because when it goes. Uh, it starts at the origin, which corresponds to some point of the torus, some origin point of the torus, some 1, comma 1 point of the torus. Um, it then goes along and exits, but then it comes back on. You can think of this, this square as having opposite sides identified. When it goes off this way, it comes back on this way. And it goes on and on like that. But, uh, but that means that it, uh, it, it actually fills up this square uh, densely. Now, let's uh, convince ourselves of that. Um, so uh, I'll leave you to, to, to think about why it is that if you if you allow uh, x to take on all these all these different values that y ends up going back over uh, over and over again and producing a dense winding of the around the um, the, the 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 unit square when you bind all those things together and so in the picture here what you end up with again is this kind of idea of a torus um, this is our t two and you have some, I didn't draw it very well, but you have some, some curve which goes like this. But when it comes back around, um, again, I'm not going to do all the details. I'll let you uh, convince yourself that this works. Um, it comes back around not to exactly where it was before and then follows a different, somewhat different path. And so it winds densely. And so you actually get a densely winding uh, curve on the, on the torus. So it comes arbitrarily close to every point of the torus. It's actually dense. 
Okay, um, so Lie groups in that sense can be very either badly behaved, or at least Lie group morphisms can be badly behaved. But in fact, this is actually mapping this real number line first to the plane as by a Lie group morphism, and then the plane to the to the torus by Lie group morphism. So the composition is a Lie group morphism. So this is actually a is actually a Lie subgroup. It's a dense um, a dense Lie subgroup. Um, so that's kind of terrible, but that's about as terrible as uh, as Lie group morphisms get. Let's see another example, say, of a Lie group morphism. Um, if I take my quaternions and I write them as I did before, um, I can factor that into two complex numbers. One complex number is sort of obvious. The uh, the the uh, the real imaginary parts, so to speak, but then we have these other imaginary parts, and we can factor that into sorry q two plus q three times i uh, times k times j times j sorry times j. Um, so we factor into one complex number and then another complex number times j, and so we write those complex numbers as um, something like uh, z plus. Now I want to write the j on the other side, I think. I want to write that as jw. So you can put the j over the other side, which requires us to change the sign. Then uh, you can check that, so writing each quaternion has a, has a pair of complex numbers, so you can check that if you associate to q the matrix z minus w, w bar, z bar, um, then you get um, uh, that, then you, that's actually going to take addition and multiplication to addition and multiplication. So um, we won't really need the addition so much, but if we think about it as multiplication, it's going to take the uh, non-zero quaternions uh, isomorphically to um, to the to some group of of, of complex matrices, um, and uh, in particular, it's going to take the unit quaternions, which we said were uh, the three-dimensional sphere sitting inside. We can think of this as R four minus the origin. Um, and uh, so the three unit sphere, you can say the unit quaternions, they're actually taken to a certain group of two by two matrices, which you can actually check is in fact SU2, the group of matrices of this form where, where the, the Z and W put together makes a unit vector. So, um, so this is a rather surprising fact that we can take the unit quaternions to two by two complex special unitary matrices, and that's a, a nice example. It's not only a, not only is it a morphism, but in fact it's actually an isomorphism. Um, you can check that it has an inverse map. Um, okay, so that's a nice example of a of a morphism of Lie groups, which is maybe a bit of a surprising one. There are quite a few little surprising ones in low dimensions that 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 turn up. There aren't so many in higher dimensions. A large part of linear algebra is about somehow about these examples of Lie groups that we've written down. Um, so, for instance, one of the another example of Lie group morphisms um, is that uh, the general linear group, uh, let's say over um, some k, and for uh, let's just make k be the real numbers or the complex numbers. We won't do quaternions because their determinant theory is much different. Um, but you can take the determinant and use it as a map to the non-zero real numbers. And the kernel of that map is, of course, the special linear group sitting inside there. And you get that this is injective. So if I make that be the kernel of this map, I can make that be the kernel of this map. And then I can make that be the kernel of this map. So each, each of these guys is the kernel of the next map. OK, then that's what's called an exact sequence. So we get this. Uh, sequence of morphisms of, of, of Lie groups, an exact sequence, because each guy is the kernel of the next map. Um, so, um, so that gives us a, 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 an exact sequence of, of these. And it's not split exact in the sense that this guy is not the product of this with this. Um, so GL and K is not the product of, of Lie groups. SLNK cross R cross. Um, it's not isomorphic uh, to the product. Okay, so it's a nice example, and it's something you've seen before. It, in some sense, it's just really the theory of the determinant. Um, but uh, now we think of it as being a, a more abstract theory of of, uh, of Lie groups. And and in general, almost every almost every theory of linear algebra is somehow uh, generalizes to a theorem about arbitrary Lie groups or about some class of Lie groups. Now. 
Uh, we really care about Lie groups because of the idea that they act on manifolds. Um, but at the same time, uh, we could say that in order to understand Lie groups, it's helpful to get them to act on manifolds. And then to understand how Lie groups act on manifolds, it's helpful to understand uh, uh, how, to, uh, how to study Lie groups and abstraction. So we want to go back and forth between thinking about them as acting and thinking about them on their own. So we want an action, a notion of an action. So uh, an action. Well, first, an action of a group on a set G on a set M is a map. Uh, this is something you should probably recall from group theory. It's a map. Let's call it Alpha takes G cross M to M. Uh, written, uh, we write it as G M to mean um, Alpha of G comma M, so that um, uh, 1 times m has to be m for all m, and um, uh, g times h times m has to be g times h times m for all g and h in the group and point in the set. Now that's the general notion of action, and so say that's just standard group theory. That's the standard definition of an action in group theory. Um, so what happens if we now want it to be um, to be a Lie group action, and so we can just write in uh, instead of action, an action of a Lie group a G on a manifold M is uh, is such a map. Now it has to be a smooth map instead of just a map, and then otherwise it's the same. Um, so the orbit um, G M is the orbit of G through a point M, and it's just the set of all places you can get to from that point M uh, by moving with an element of G. That's, that's the same definition as you'd expect in group theory. If a Lie group acts, we'll usually write something like this, acts on a manifold, um, and the same Lie group acts on another manifold, then uh, we'll say that a, a map, let's say F takes P to Q, is said to be G equivariant if it satisfies that when you do the group action first and then apply the map, it's the same thing as if you apply the map first and then do the group action. And again, that's for all uh, G and G and P and P. So that's how we can relate two different actions on two different manifolds. Um, so that's a very important idea because sometimes actions are very complicated, but it may be that the action on P, which is very complicated, uh, somehow quotients down to some simpler action or sits in some way, maps in some way to some simpler action on Q, and uh, vice versa. We may find a very simple action on P uh, somehow uh, mapping itself into a more complicated action on Q. So it may be useful to study in, in both directions. Now there are some obvious examples, um, which you've probably already seen in group theory. Um, the most obvious example is to get the group of um, rotations, or they're called rotations, right? The special linear group. It's either called the, or sorry, special, special orthogonal group, which is its fancy name, but it's also called the group of rotations. And it acts on the sphere. This should be the n minus 1 sphere, because the n minus 1 dimensional sphere, and again, remember, that's our notation that superscripts usually mean dimension. This is the n minus 1 dimensional sphere. It contained an Rn. We have to get it to act, be n minus 1 dimensional, because it has to be an Rn in Rn, because we're getting this guy to act on Rn. S-O-N acts on Rn. So, um, so that acts on this sphere sitting in this space as rotations of the sphere. And that's exactly the rotations of the sphere, because once you rotate the sphere, there's a unique way to extend that to a, um, to, um, a, a, a rotation of the, of the whole of Euclidean space. This is an example of a, we could call it, a, 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 a homogeneous space. Um, probably should be called a homogeneous manifold, but it's very traditional to call it a homogeneous space rather than a manifold. A homogeneous space is a uh, manifold um, M equipped with a transitive action of a Lie group. 
What does transitive mean? It means that the orbit of any point is the whole manifold. Every point can be brought to every other point by an action of element of the group. And the rotation ex uh, rotations are a nice example of that. You can rotate any vector into any other vector. So the sphere is a homogeneous space. We can say S n minus 1 is a homogeneous space of uh, S o n as an example. Now, uh, so homogeneous spaces play a special role in the theory of, of Lie group actions because they're somehow the, the, the ones we have a best, our best chance of getting a grip on. They really are somehow intrinsic to the, to the group itself, um, and they're easiest to describe. Then the other ones somehow are built out of them. Another example, again from linear algebra, is that the, the Grismannian of uh, p-dimensional subspaces of a vector space is a homogeneous space uh, of, well, it's a homogeneous space of the general linear group um, of the vector space, the group of all invertible linear transformations of the vector space in a trivial way. We haven't actually proven this. We have to, there's a lot of work to do because you still have, haven't proven that, you know, that, that, that this guy smoothly acts on this guy and transitively. There's some work to, to be done, but not a lot of work. Um, so we'll have to check that. But in fact, um, if you're working with, say, the real numbers, then you could also get the orthogonal group. Uh, so also, well, let's say orthogonal group, let's say if k is um, the real numbers and if v is uh, our n, then the orthogonal group also acts uh, on this guy and also acts transitively. You can rotate any p-dimensional subspace to any other p-dimensional subspace by 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 a, or a rotation. So the orthogonal group acts, actually the rotation group also acts uh, on this guy. And it's homogeneous for both of them. And it's also homogeneous for this guy. So we have um, so we have this guy, this guy, and G L N R acting. And they all act transitively. Um, so there are maybe many, many different groups acting on the same manifold producing a, a homogeneous space of different groups on the same manifold. We're interested in linear algebra. All of our examples are coming from linear algebra. So naturally, uh, we're interested in the linear algebra examples. Um, so a representation, usually written as rep, uh, and often just called rep uh, in, when we pronounce it, um, is, uh, uh, is an action. Uh, Lie group action, all of our actions are Lie group actions from now on, uh, of G on a vector space. And the vector space could be um, real or complex um, or quaternionic, in which uh, each um, transformation V goes to GV, so this is in the vector space and this is in the vector space, is a linear map, is linear. Now all of our examples have obvious uh, representations so we can you know, let's get them to act as, as linear transformations because all of our examples are actually just matrices and every matrix acts in an obvious way as linear transformations. So, uh, so in fact, uh, the representations are, are already showing up without, uh, without any effort. In, in every example we have so far, there are lots and lots of representations. Let's look at some simple examples of, of actions, um, and very simple cases. Um, we can look at the, at the quaternions and how they relate to rotations of three-dimensional space. So let's look at rotations of ordinary R3. Um, so we, we've said that we had this unit, this group of unit uh, quaternions, um, S3 is the unit length quaternions. Um, now, if you have a unit length quaternion, you can try and get it to um, to act on things in various ways. Um, so, uh, so we have the unit quaternions. We also have the imaginary quaternions. Those are quaternions that look like they have no real part. So the Q naught part is zero, plus Q one i plus Q two j plus Q three k, and that's of course three dimensional space. So the imaginary quaternions we'll think of as R three. Now, if we have um, 
a Q non-zero quaternion, and if we have an R, an imaginary quaternion, which I'll think of as being an R3, then you can check that Q R Q bar is also imaginary, where Q bar um, it means the conjugate, so Q is Q naught plus I, Q1 plus J, Q2 plus K, Q3 has conjugate given by keeping the same real part and then getting rid of the, uh, getting, sorry, getting the imaginary part to change sign. Okay, so that's the, uh, the what we mean by conjugate of a quaternion, and I'll let you check that, um, that this gives us a map then that takes uh, a, any real uh, vector in R3, which we think of as an imaginary quaternion, to this imaginary quaternion. Moreover, um, it actually um, preserves length because uh, the length of A times B with quaternions is length A, length B uh, for quaternions, where length means the obvious thing. Length of quaternion Q is just the square root of the sum of squares of the entries. So, um, so this leads to um, the observation that if you have, uh, if Q is a unit length, uh, any unit length quaternion, and you take any R uh, real uh, vector, so in other words, imaginary quaternion, then you can map it to this uh, this thing, which I want to call rho of Q R, is defined to be Q R Q bar. So that's an operation that's gonna it's gonna take a vector and produce a vector. And what we've discovered from this guy, from this fact here, we've discovered that this this operation preserves length because this guy's length is going to be the same as the length of R. Um, so we discovered therefore that rho of Q uh, has length, rho of QR has length equal to length R. And that means therefore that rho of Q is an orthogonal transformation. It must be an orthogonal transformation of three-dimensional Euclidean space. In fact, it's better than that because um, the Q came from the, the sphere, the three-dimensional sphere, which we sort of think of as if it was a two-dimensional sphere. But anyway, that's connected. And, so, and it starts with, at some point, it has Q um, equal to, let's say, one uh, quaternion sitting in it somewhere. And so it was connected. And so if we think about the determinant of rho of Q, they have a map Q in the three sphere goes to the determinant of rho of Q, which is in the well. It's a it's a real number. Um, it's a determinant as a as a real linear transformation on R three, right? So it's going to be a, a a real number, a non-zero real number, right? X for this non-zero ones. So it's the non-zero real number. But um, but in fact, uh, because it's orthogonal, because it's an orthogonal uh, matrix, orthogonal matrix have determinants plus and minus one. So this guy's not just in here, it's actually in the set plus or minus one. But the three sphere is connected. We said it's connected. And so this determinant varies continuously as we move around in the three sphere. And um, it varies among the values plus and minus one. It starts when Q is one. Uh, we can calculate out that, of course, rho of Q, uh, R, is just one R one, which is just R. And so rho of 1 is the identity matrix. And so it has determinant equal to 1. And as a consequence, by continuity, since it's determinant's 1 there, and we move in a continuous manifold, it must actually, or on a connected manifold with a continuous function, it must always stay 1. And so what we find, therefore, is that rho of q is, in fact, a rotation. It's, a, it's a, an orthogonal transformation with determinant 1. So now what we have is we have a row, we have defined a row operation, which takes the three sphere to SO3. It's going to be a, an operation which takes a quaternion and maps it to the map, which takes a, an imaginary quaternion and maps it to QR, Q bar. Um, so this is somehow represented as a rotation matrix, but we don't know how. And this is a unit quaternion. Now, um, the unit quaternion is easy to describe because it's just got to be any vector, uh, for any four-dimensional vector, which has length 1. And this is uh, used often in computer science as, as, a, as a way to deal with, with rotations of space. You describe them in terms of quaternions. We can actually make this very explicit. Um, we can actually see what the, what the rotation looks like. 
um, because of the following rather simple trick. I won't fill in all the details, but um, I'll let you uh, check that if, if, we, if we take an angle theta and we take u, an imaginary quaternion, so it's an imaginary quaternion, then we let q be e to the theta u. We can expand that out in the series expansion. I'll let you check that this actually um, gives you that rho of q is the rotation by an angle, not theta, but an angle 2 theta um, around uh, the vector u. Okay, so that gives us a, um, and we can, so let's, say, let's suppose it's a unit imaginary quaternion. So we take a unit imaginary quaternion at an angle, and we rotate. So the picture should be this is u, and then what we're doing is we're rotating the theta as measuring an angle in this plane perpendicular to u, and we're rotating. So u is an imaginary quaternion, so it means it's just an element of R3, just an ordinary vector in R3. We take a vector in R3, here's R3, here's a vector, and then we, it's a unit vector, and we rotate it around this guy by some angle theta, and then it, it turns out that rho of q is actually rotation by angle 2 theta, so maybe I should call that 2 theta, um, around that guy. Um, again, you can check all of that. So it follows, not with not much, much effort, that uh, this is uh, this map rho, uh, which is taking the unit length quaternions to the rotations, is actually on to. Why is that? Because every rotation of three-dimensional space looks like this. And uh, that's really because of its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So if you go back to linear algebra, I'll leave you to, to think about why. You can check that um, every linear transformation that rotates around uh, rotates around some axis by some angle in three-dimensional space. It's not true in higher dimensions, but in three dimensions it is true because there has to be an eigenvector which is a unit uh, eigenvalue eigenvector. I know there's a fixed vector of any rotation and then there has to be a plane in which it rotates around which is perpendicular to that vector. So I'll leave you to convince yourself of that basic geometric fact about rotations of three-dimensional space. So this has to therefore be onto. And we can actually find its kernel um, um, so its kernel is going to be the set of all q's such that rho of q, um, rho of q is 1. But that's exactly the set of, uh, so that's to be, of course, unit length, so q, of q unit length such that um, q r q bar is r for all r in uh, the imaginary quaternions, which you think of as r3. Um, and if you rewrite that, maybe it's easier to rewrite it as QR is, we multiply both sides by Q and we get RQ since um, we have Q, I'll let you check, Q, Q bar is 1 for um, unit quaternions. So, uh, so that gives you this guy for all R in R3. There's a lot of details for you to check, but um, it's not too bad. Then you should be able to figure out that... Um, that uh, this equation here, actually, when you plug in all the possible r's, it actually forces uh, q to be uh, plus and minus 1. So it's got plus and minus 1 as its kernel contained in the unit quaternions, the plus and 1 and minus 1 unit quaternions. So it means that, in fact, we get, um, we get S3 uh, going to SO3, which is therefore, uh, as a manifold, S3 modulo plus and minus 1. In other words, it's exactly the real projective, real projective uh, three-dimensional space. So that gives us a surprising fact, which is not obvious, that the rotations of three-dimensional space are represented by, as a manifold, by the real projective three-dimensional space. In, in our next lecture, we'll go deeper into the structure theory of Lie groups and understand more about both their global aspects and also about how we think of them in terms of vector fields and their brackets.